All right, welcome everyone. We have Dr. Finelli here tonight. Dr. Finelli is originally from suburban Philadelphia and attended, attended the Pennsylvania College of Optometry. He has been in private practice uh, at, 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 since that time at Coastal North Carolina, specializing in ocular disease management. He is the founder and clinical director of Cape Fear Eye Institute in Wilmington, North Carolina. He has lectured extensively around the globe on a variety of topics dealing with primary, pr dealing primarily with advanced diagnostic and therapeutic modalities. He has developed a course for certifying ODs in the use of injections in primary care and has been used by several states and was the first optometrist to reach and in, to teach injection procedures at national meetings in the United States. Jim, I'm going to kind of digress, digress from that and say thank you for doing that for our profession. Thank you, Greg. It's something that needs to be done and should be a day-to-day -day part of our practice, or at least week-to-week -week part Absolutely. of our practices. Absolutely. Thank you for doing that. Dr. Finelli is a con contributing editor for the Review of Optometry and is the author of the bi-monthly Glaucoma Grand Rounds column. He is the past president of the North Carolina State Board of Examiners in Optometry. He is also a past trustee of the North Carolina State Optometric Society, where he served as continuing education chairman. He serves as the chairman of the iSKI Optometric Conference, and uh, and this is a this is a really dear one here, the CE in Italy and Europe Conference. He is adjunct faculty member of PCO, Pennsylvania College of Optometry, Western University Health Science, and UAB School of Optometry. Dr. Finelli, thank you for being here tonight. It's truly an honor and a pleasure. I'm sure you're going to hear the uh, the virtual uh, round of applause. Everyone, please welcome Dr. Finelli. Thanks, Jim. Greg, thank you so much for the uh, very kind kind words, introduction, and um, for putting on a, a you know a great series of CE programs, keeping it relevant to clinical practice. Uh, Obviously, the, you know, where we, where we practice, what our state laws are, uh, play a big role in how we practice. And I think finally, we now have all 50 states uh, allowing ODs to manage glaucoma. It took a while uh, for a couple of the states to finally get on board, but we're all here now. And uh, an integral part of managing glaucoma from the front end on initial diagnosis to ultimately managing these patients throughout their life uh, is utilizing OCT. And if we can properly utilize our OCTs, it really does maximize the patient's care. And that's kind of what I wanted to, to talk about. We can get lost in some of the details with our OCTs because there are a lot of excellent OCT manufacturers out there. Uh, each individual OCT unit has its own pros and cons. So I, I, I try to, to make this uh, a universal program that uh, will be germane to independent, will be germane to whatever type of, of OCT instrument uh, that you have. And for those docs that are on board tonight that don't have uh, OCTs, hopefully this will be at least a, a way that you can get a feel for what these things can do for you in uh, making your glaucoma care better and actually making your life a whole lot uh, easier and less gray hairs trying to figure out, do I have a problem? Does the patient worsen? Does this patient need medicine, uh, et cetera. So with that said, uh, there are a few disclosures and primarily the, the biggest disclosure is the, the first one I have listed, Heidelberg Engineering. I am on their advisory board and I am in private practice. So the instrumentation that we have, you know, uh, just like any other private practitioner, these instruments cost money. I have to do a fair amount of, uh, you know, research on the front end to figure out what these instruments are gonna cost. What's my return on investment? Uh, because I'm paying for these. These are not, uh, I'm not in an academic institution. So although I do uh, consult with Heidelberg Engineering and I do have, a Heidelberg Spectralis uh, in our clinic. And furthermore, most of the uh, examples that we're gonna see are Heidelberg um, Spectralis 
scans, the, the topics and, and what I'm going to talk about would be, again, germane to just about all. So with that, there really are no conflicts of interest um, that are going to show up in this presentation. Three key points that I would like to uh, touch on. Uh, knowing your technology, and that's where we're going to spend the majority of our time, uh, knowing what your technology is, how it differs from other technologies, uh, and, and kind of what that what technology is going to bring to the table to make your patient care experience uh, a, a bit more easy. A couple of suggestions on how to approach the new patient, and hopefully by the time we get through the technology, aspect of the presentation, you'll have a good feel for how to approach the new patient. And then, of course, how to approach the established patient when we're seeing our glaucoma patients in follow-up. Okay, so knowing your technology. Two important points, and I want to hit the, uh, the, the big elephant in the room right up front, and that's reference databases. And then we'll talk for one slide, I think it is, on resolution and image registration. You know, I get a lot of questions. I see a lot of posts on a variety of different uh, forums regarding OCTs. Why does my patient who has normal pressures and, and normal looking optic nerves have such a completely devastated ganglion cell layer? And I'm, and I'm looking at the scans that, uh, that are being presented and we see a lot of red. And, and, you know, there's, there's this term red disease, which is coined uh, because of the normative reference databases that uh, we see with all of our OCT technology. So I want to hit that, that particular topic right up front. Now, it's important for us to know what our individual instruments do, because what they do ultimately play a role in what they tell us. But it's also equally important to know what our instrument doesn't do. What kind of assumptions can we make? What kind of inferences can we make given what the OCT is showing us? But also what kind of inferences would be a little bit too much of a stretch and it's really not sound clinical decision making. So knowing the, in, the nuances of our individual technologies is very important. At the end of the day, Quite simply, <clears throat> OCT technology is histology. It's quantitative histology. We know gross anatomy. We can look at the eye. We can see gross retinal anatomy. We can see gross optic nerve anatomy. But the OCT really gives us the histologic advantage of seeing what's going on on a cellular, on a micronic level to see what is happening, how much tissue is there, how much tissue has been lost, is that tissue uh, un remaining unchanged. So again, this all boils down to the technology that's put into our individual boxes, whether that's a Topcon box or whether that's a Heidelberg box or a Zeiss box, doesn't matter. We just need to know what our technology does. So going back to reference databases, most OCTs are going to have a perioptic RNFL circle scan or sometimes called a circumpapillary RNFL circle scan. Uh, and these scans typically are presented or scanned uh, in a T-SNIT fashion. In other words, the scan begins temporally, it moves in a perioptic fashion superiorly nasally, inferiorly, and finishes temporally. For the most part, when we're looking at RNFL circle scans, glaucoma is going to involve the temporal half of the optic nerve. We're really not going to see a lot of early glaucomatous damage on the nasal aspect. So if I had to say which part of the optic nerve is most important, it's the temporal side. And really when it gets down to glaucoma, it's the inferior temporal sector and the superior temporal sector. But going back to reference databases, this B scan is basically obtained and that is plotted either in a T-SNIT graph or as we'll see uh, with some of the newer technologies, we're moving to an N-STIN graph. In other words, the scan begins nasally, superiorly, temporally, inferiorly, and nasally. There are some advantages to that, primarily in that it gives us a clean sweep 
through the temporal aspect. But be that as it may, this B scan ultimately gives us retinal thickness and that retinal thickness is plotted against a reference database. Each individual company has its own reference database as far as age, as far as sex, as far as the race of the individuals, but we're all going to be seeing something that looks like this, where the implication is that red is dangerous or bad, yellow is cautionary and green is good. The problem is we're dealing essentially with statistics and statistics can be manipulated in a variety of different ways and can be somewhat uh, deceiving in how they are presented. When we're looking at this particular T-SNIT or NSTIN graph, the patient's actual data is usually plotted as a dark black line. So in this particular case, everything is normal, and it would be easy to say that this patient doesn't have glaucoma. We cannot do that for a couple of reasons. All reference databases are based upon a normative curve, a, a, a bell-shaped curve where the majority of patients who are healthy fall in the middle. And since we're talking about glaucoma and loss of tissue, the majority of patients who have loss of tissue are going to be on the left side of this curve. But as with any bell curve, if, if this bell curve, for example, represented the heights, how tall people are, in the United States. We have short people on this side, we have average height folks in the middle, and we have tall people on this side. We can't really say that individuals that are shorter in height necessarily are abnormal. What we can say is that individuals who are shorter in height or taller in height fall outside that main reference point or that main group of folks in the middle. And that's the key here with reference databases. These are statistically normal. Folks who show up in the yellow or in the red may not be statistically normal, but they may have characteristics that are normal for them. So we cannot say, and we cannot make a firm diagnosis one way or the other, whether a patient has glaucoma, just looking at a reference database. So again, when we're looking at glaucoma, we're typically thinking about loss of tissue. Uh, whereas if we're looking at neuroophthalmic disorders, if the optic nerve, for example, is very edematous, we're going to have uh, thickness measures that are higher than normal. But this is just, as it says, a reference Point. So reference databases really are statistical measures only. They compare your patient to like norms, whatever the like norms are in that reference database, as far as age, as far as sex, as far as race. But it basically gives us a, a point for where our patient fits into other individuals. The bad is that we can rely too much on the color combinations and our eyes automatically go to that red, that yellow, and that green. And, and we're kind of automatically programmed to say, oh, red is bad. Red probably is bad and it may be bad, but it's not always bad. So here's the point. Reference databases do not tell us if a patient has glaucoma. So I would caution you to not make diagnostic decisions based solely on what your reference database is showing you. It's just one piece to the puzzle. And where reference databases do have a bit of a role is in the initial evaluation of your patient. When you're evaluating a new patient, you want to kind of get a feel for where that patient fits in against like norms. Once you've made your decision, whether they have glaucoma and they need to be treated, or if they are just a glaucoma suspect and they need to be monitored. Reference databases at that point really play no role. The patient's reference database becomes their previous scans and you're looking ultimately for change over time. So let's just hit that right up front. Let's, let's pay attention minimally to reference databases, but I don't put a whole lot of faith in them. And here's two examples of how they both help and hinder. Uh, here's a an RNFL circle scan, uh, and this begins temporally. So this is gonna be plotted as a T-SNIT graph. And typically in a normal, healthy optic nerve, the inferior temporal perioptic RNFL and the superior temporal 
perioptic RNFL are the thickest areas. That's why you get this typically double hump. Now, in this particular individual, if we notice here, inferiorly, inferior temporally, there is a bit of statistical thinning. So this particular quadrant, and these are Garway Heath sectors, this particular quadrant is flagged as red. And I would venture a guess that most of us, when we looked at this particular scan, went right to the red. And what this is implying is that this particular area, inferior temporally along this circle scan path, is statistically thinner than most individuals. Now, reality is that most of the time glaucoma affects the optic nerve infrotemporally. So this would be suggestive of ganglion cell or axonal loss inferior temporally. Now compare and contrast that to this particular individual. If we look at this on face B scan, we can see a wedge defect superior temporally here. But when we look at our Garway Heath sectors, everything is green. Of course, the devil with all OCT interpretation is in the details. And when we look at our T-SNIT graph, we do in fact see that in this one sector right here, we do have our RNFL thickness dipping down into a statistically aberrant area. So why isn't this superior temporal sector lighting up as yellow or even red? And the answer is that although there is a defect here, this defect is not wide enough, nor is it deep enough to flag or to cause this entire sector to be abnormal. This entire sector still is as an entire sector normal, but there is a small wedge defect. So again, we see this wedge defect here. We can see some loss here. That makes sense. Here we see a wedge defect, but if we're just looking at the uh, Garway Heath sectors, we're going to be misinformed there a little bit. Now, moving on to reg uh, registration and resolution. Image registration is important and resolution is important. Each instrument has its own ways of, of registering images when you're doing follow-ups. Uh, and each instrument has its own, you know, resolution as far as how, you know, how many res how many microns can can their OCT scan resolve. And the question is, you know, for example, is a 10 micron difference significant? Well, that's really going to depend on a couple of things. It depends on what you're looking at. For example, the entire retinal thickness, of course, it's going to be a little bit thicker around the uh, perifoveal region, but entire retinal thickness is going to be around 250 microns. So a 10 micron change is really not all that significant when we're looking at retinal thickness. However, if we're looking at the ganglion cell layer in the macula, the ganglion cell layer is only about 40 to 45 to 50 microns. So a 10 micron change in the ganglion cell layer would be considered significant. And the other piece to this puzzle is if your instrument only resolves 10 microns, that may be the difference that you're seeing from one test to the another when to another when in fact there is no substantive change in the patient's retinal anatomy. The other piece to this is image registration. Now here I have a picture of a patient with central serous chorioretinopathy. And I think we can all appreciate the fact that we have a, a, an elevated dome here. And we know that if we're taking a cross section B scan through a dome, we're gonna see elevation. And let's say for sake of argument, because this particular CSR individual, it's not centered on the fovea. It's really the apex of that dome is right about where my pointer is. If I take a, an OCT scan through that apex, I'm gonna get a certain thickness at that apex. If I take another scan, let's say for example, a few microns inferior to that on the same day, because this is a, let's say a perfectly spherical dome, that second OCT scan is going to be less thick. In other words, it's gonna look a little bit thinner. And we can interpret that as well, that CSR has really improved. The only way that we can prove worsening stability or improvement in the case of CSR is to go back to that same exact scan location as where our first scan was. And that's where image registration 
plays a role. Some instruments, some OCT instruments are better at image registration than our others. So we need to know what it is that our instrument does. We need to know, does our instrument have image registration? And we need to know the resolution of our particular instrument. For example, here's an individual where we're looking at a patient with moderate glaucoma, we can see uh, a relatively uh, cupped out optic nerve, a very thin neuroretinal rim. We're seeing a patient for a follow-up glaucoma scan, and we're looking at the perioptic RNFL. Now, the perioptic RNFL is usually around, you know, 120 microns, 100 microns thick. But in this particular follow-up scan, right where I have, have demarcated this, this patient has lost 26 microns from our baseline scan to our follow-up scan. Is that significant? Absolutely. A 26 micron drop in RNFL, when we're only looking at something that's about 100 microns thick, is 25%. So that certainly becomes statistically significant. So with that, we'll stop real quick and take our first polling question. In regards to reference databases, findings in red indicate what? Hopefully, we know the answer to this. Now, Jim, as, as we're rolling in, there, there's a question that came in. I think this is a good time to take it. Do you <laughs> consider an RNFL defect wedge pathognomonic for glaucoma? This clinician says I have hey, some patients that I have them, but normal ILP and have not progressed. Uh, actually, that's a great question. And I'm going to give you a couple, if, if that person can hold on for a couple slides, we're going to go to just that. Sometimes the answer is yes, and sometimes no, um, but it's not always pathognomonic of glaucoma. Great. Are you going to talk about some of the things that you, that you see that cause, that cause RNFL defects, Jim? Because I'll wait in my comment. Uh, yes. What can cause RNFL defects are ganglion cell body loss that is beginning to cause an RNFL defect that hasn't worked its way over yet to the optic nerve. So th that's, that's one in the context of glaucoma, a variety of optic neuropathies will cause loss of axons, typically temporally, but usually axonal loss in the non-glaucomatous optic neuropathies will tend to affect the papillomacular bundle first rather than the superior and inferior temporal uh, sectors. So the, the, you know, the polling question here is, was answered correctly. Red just simply means that the patient falls outside of statistical norms, period, end of sentence. It does not mean that they necessarily have disease. Okay, and that's and, where the term red disease comes from. And Jim, I just want to just remind everyone that I did post at 724 in the chat box your handout for this. It's also in the okay. emails, but it's also in the chat box to be downloaded. Thank you. Perfect. All right. So kind of getting along to, to the question that was just raised, where does glaucomatous damage occur? Well, it, certainly it occurs at the optic nerve. Glaucoma is a disease that affects the optic nerve, but in the context of OCT technology, where are we looking? We're typically looking near the optic nerve. We're not always looking at the neuroretinal rim. For those of us who are seasoned, and I've had the good fortune of practicing in, in North Carolina uh, for over 30 years, 35 years now, right out of the chute, being able to manage glaucoma well before OCT technology was available. And we spent all of our time, I examined this neuroretinal rim very, very carefully as best we could with fundus photography at the slit lamp. But when we got our OCTs, our OCT instantly went away from the optic nerve and went to that area near the optic nerve, namely the perioptic RNFL. So our OCTs look here and our, our, our OCTs also look over in the macula. And I wanna take a, a, a good look at each of these three areas. So this begs the question, where does the damage occur? Now, here's an individual. Now, now first of all, let me back up. These are multicolor images from the spectralis. It's, um, these are three layer stack, three laser stacked images. And um, depending upon which laser, we can highlight the RNFL. So here's an individual with moderate glaucoma. And if we go to the green reflectance image, we can certainly see some wedge 
defects. And we can see several wedge defects superiorly. We can see some perhaps thinning, some diffuse thinning here. So if we took an RNFL circle scan starting temporally, and we began to take, we began, oop, let me go back. Uh, we began to take our scans. As our scan progresses here, we're going to see a robust RNFL. We're going to see a slight dip down in that T-SNIT graph. We're going to see robust RNFL here. We're going to definitely see a drop off here. We're not really worried so much about the nasal retina. We're going to see robust RNFL here and maybe a drop off here. So that's where our double hump uh, map kind of gets a little bit... Um, aberrant where we see these drops where we would normally see uh, a, a smooth double hump. So this patient clearly has glaucomatous damage based upon the physical exam of the cup, but also the RNFL. Now here's a patient, uh, Hickam's dictum, who can bring as many diseases as they want to the table. This patient also has diabetic maculopathy, not clinically significant, but we do have some MAs in the uh, foveal avascular zone. But this patient also has moderately advanced glaucoma. And not only can we see some wedge defects down here, we can see some striations here, but we see a very, very large wedge defect here. So certainly if we're taking an RNFL circle scan, we're going to see a drop off in that T-SNIT graph here, and we're going to see some striations here. But also if we take a macular thickness scan or a ganglion cell layer thickness scan, we're going to see damage from glaucoma here in the macula as well. So my point is, not only do we need to look at the perioptic RNFL, we also need to look at the macula. And if our OCTs allow us to, we also need to look very closely and carefully at the neuroretinal rim. And here's an individual that reminded me of the, of the question that, that Joe just uh, was presented with. Here we have a wedge defect. And this wedge defect is pretty far out. Now, I was always taught that if the wedge defect doesn't get to the optic nerve, it's not really a glaucomatous visual field defect. And there's a, there's a fair amount of, of, of questioning going on in where does glaucomatous damage occur first? Do we see the early signs in the neuroretinal rim? Do we see it at the perioptic RNFL? Do we see it over here in the macula with loss of ganglion cell bodies? And then as the ganglion cell bodies atrophy, the axons eventually atrophy, and maybe it progresses to the optic nerve. And I think the answer to that question really depends upon the individual because there are a variety of factors that can affect that. So here we have a wedge defect that may or may not be related to glaucoma. This may be related to ganglion cell body loss where the axons have atrophy, but not made it all the way yet to the optic nerve. And we'll get to that a bit more in detail. So our OCTs allow us to evaluate the RNFL. We need to look there. We need to look at the macula, but we also need to look at the neuroretinal rim, in particular utilizing BMO, which is Brooks membrane opening. And several uh, OCTs now are looking at Brooks membrane opening to give us a feel for what's happening at the optic nerve, not around the optic nerve and not over in the macula, but also at the optic nerve itself. So let's take a quick look at the perioptic RNFL first. Typically, perioptic RNFL circle scans are going to be about three millimeters, three and a half millimeters in diameter, and they could be either starting temporally and pre present us with a T-SNIT graph, or they can start nasally and present us with an N-STIN graph. This particular printout is right and left eye. Uh, and both of these uh, T-SNIT graphs look relatively normal. However, one of the, um, one of the, the more convenient ways to compare uh, an individual against a, a reference data point is the patient's fellow eye. And when we overlay this patient's right and left T-SNIT graphs, we can see that the left T-SNIT graph, especially inferior temporally, is a little bit asymmetric as compared to the inferior temporal sector in the fellow eye. So typically our RNFL circle scans are gonna come with a printout that looks something like this, where we have our double hump 
curves. We can have our right and left superimposed. We can have our Garway Heath sectors. And in this particular example, we have a yellow flag to the inferior temporal sector of the left eye. Okay, here's a glaucoma, classic glaucoma RNFL circle scan. Again, this is a T-SNIT graph of an individual with moderately advanced glaucoma. We have lost our superior temporal thickness. We have lost our inferior temporal thickness. Our eyes are drawn here. We really shouldn't go here. This just tells us statistically this is outside the normal range. But when we look at this optic nerve in vivo, and then when we look at the OCT, this kind of matches up with what we're seeing. We're seeing thinning superior temporally and inferior temporally. Although the nasal rim for the most part remains relatively healthy and extreme temporal rim that papillomacular bundle also remains healthy. And that's an important point. Papillomacular bundle is typically one of the last areas to go in glaucoma. So we're looking at damage first inferior temporally followed by superior temporally. So here's a food for thought. As I said earlier, we don't know if the damage is occurring initially at the macula and working its way toward the optic nerve, or in some individuals that damage may be occurring at the optic nerve and may show up eventually as defects in the ganglion cell layer over in the, macula, in the macula. So maybe, maybe we should, instead of looking at just one RNFL circle scan, perhaps we should look at several different diameter RNFL, RNFL circle scans to see what is happening there. So here's a scan. This is the uh, GMPE software on the, um, the Spectralis, where we have standard RNFL circle scans, but there are three of them. Now, this is also, again, plotted against a reference database. This is a healthy individual. This is a three and a half millimeter scan. We've got that classic double hump. We have our Garway Heath sectors. But think about what's happening in a healthy individual these axons start to get piled up the closer we get to the optic nerve. So the closer we are to the optic nerve, this RNFL is going to be thicker than the RNFL further away from the optic nerve. And that can help us in plotting progression, for example. Now, this is a, a, a representation of, again, of a normal, healthy individual. And just looking at the average data, the average thickness of the RNFL in the superior temporal sector in this smaller three and a half millimeter scan, it's 132 microns. And notice as we go further away from the optic nerve, that thickness tends to decrease. This is entirely normal. Now, I'm not saying we need to plot this, but where this comes in handy is if we were to plot it, obviously circle scans closer to the optic nerve are gonna be thicker, the further away are going to be thinner. But if this patient was to develop glaucoma, it can happen in a couple of different ways. If for example, this plot, this line tends to drop off steeper, we know that we're losing ganglion cells and we're losing RNFL axons further away from the optic nerve faster than we're losing axons closer to the optic nerve. Whereas if this, of course, as we lose tissue, this, this line's going to fall down further. If this becomes a flatter curve, if this becomes a flatter line with time, we know that we're losing ganglion cells and axons closer to the optic nerve and not at the same rate further away from the optic nerve. So that can kind of help us to see where that damage is occurring faster and therefore in subsequent follow-up scans where we can pay better attention. Are we going to pay attention more to that three and a half millimeter scan? Or are we going to pay more attention to the 4.7 millimeter scan? Truth be told, we're going to pay attention to all of those scans, but where's that damage occurring? early. Now let's move over into the macula again, because the, the OCT gives us the ability to look at the macula. And the question here is why should we be interested in the macula for glaucoma? Well, glaucoma is a disease that affects ganglion cells, axons, and we see those axons all congested at the optic nerve. 
But the ganglion cell layer, the ganglion cell body is multi-layered in the macular region. And it accounts for approximately 40% of total retinal thickness in the center of the macula. But more importantly than that, the entire retinal ganglion cell population, every one of those axons that we see at the optic nerve, they all come from retinal ganglion cell bodies. And half of those axons, roughly half of those axons at the optic nerve have the ganglion cell bodies in the macula. So if our OCT has the technology and has the ability to resolve four or five, six microns worth of change, that's the perfect tool to evaluate ganglion cell bodies over in the macula. Now, there's kind of a graphic representation of the density of ganglion cell bodies. The closer we get to the fovea, of course, in the center foveal avascular zone, there are no ganglion cell bodies, but the ganglion cell bodies are highly, highly congested around the fovea and the perifoveal region. So the further away we move from dead center macula, the less dense these ganglion cell bodies become. And that's why, and I'm going to have to bring in visual fields here a little bit. Uh, that's why visual fields tend to undersample the macula because of the relative nonlinear distribution of ganglion cells uh, in the macula. Visual field generally is relatively less sensitive to ganglion cell loss in the macula if we are using a 24 2 visual field. And I'll get to that point in a minute. But here we have a, a schematic of an individual with an arcuate defect. I think we can all appreciate the fact that there is a bit of an arcuate defect here. And superimposed on this are the testing points in a 24-2 visual field. When, when this size three spot is, is thrown on the retina here, we're only tickling about 10 ganglion cells, whereas we move here, we're tickling about 35 ganglion cells, but when we move just adjacent to the center of the foveal avascular zone, we're hitting about 230 ganglion cells. The point being that about 50% of all the axons in this optic nerve come from this central, central 20 degrees. And when we're doing a 24-2 visual field test, we're really only testing these 16 points. How many of us have seen, and the answer is really all of us, this patient who presents to us with a suspect nerve and we run a 24-2 visual field and we see one or two points that are lighting up. Not enough to be consistent with a visual field defect. We're taught that we have to have three contiguous points on a visual field to be characterized as a real defect, plus it has to be repeatable. But when we're only, when we're only testing 16 points here, we're gonna miss subtle defects. So for example, this point's gonna be normal, this point's gonna be normal, this point's gonna be abnormal, this one may or may not be abnormal. So this is the classic example of when we run a visual field, we're gonna see one, maybe two points on that 24-2 visual field. So let's go back to OCT and, and macular thickness. We need to consider two things. We need to consider overall retinal thickness, overall macular thickness, I should say, and the ganglion cell layer alone. Okay, so here we have a topographical map in a normal healthy distribution. The perifoveal retina is nice and thick and plush and well perfused. Again, 40% of this thickness overall is ganglion cells, but we have a lot of other structures in the macula here. So one of the ways that this can be plotted is an eight by eight grid with total retinal thickness in each of these three degree uh, places. That kind of helps us, but where it really helps us goes to what I said earlier about uh, using the same eye or the fellow eye as a reference point. We can have inter-eye asymmetry. Again, a hallmark of glaucoma is that there's going to be asymmetry between the two eyes. And what this particular total retinal thickness map is showing us is that these areas right here, these few boxes, these three degree, three degree squares in the right eye as compared to the comparable three degree squares in the left eye is statistically 
aberrant. So this is showing us that there is some asymmetry and potential damage in the right that we don't see in the left. Again, this is statistics and statistics can be measured and twisted around in a variety of different ways. But this surely is suggestive of glaucoma because this is typically where glaucoma causes its early stages of damage, inferior temporally. So not only can we have asymmetry between the eyes, we can also have asymmetry within the same eye. General rule of thumb is what's happening above the horizontal raphe in a healthy eye should be happening below the horizontal raphe. And here, the same eye, we definitely have some thinning inferiorly temporally as compared to comparable points mm -hmm. superior temporally. So not only is there a difference between the eyes, there's a difference in the hemisphere within the same eye. Now, the downside to using total retinal thickness when we're looking for glaucoma in the macula is that overall retinal thickness, thickness can be influenced by several diseases, in particular, angiogenic macular degeneration, certain macular dystrophies. Uh, if this is going to be a wet AMD, of course, it's going to be thinner. If it's going to be geographic RPE atrophy, total retinal thickness or total macular thickness is going to be thinner. Also, VMTs. ERMs, VMAs are also going to make our total macular thickness readings a bit thicker than normal. So instead of perhaps using total macular thickness, we really should be using the ganglion cell layer thickness alone because the ganglion cell layer thickness is going to be much less influenced by comorbid macular disease. And frankly, the ganglion cell layer are the cell bodies of the axons that are damaged in glaucoma. Now, some instruments can siphon out just the ganglion cell layers. Other instruments will use what is called the ganglion cell complex. So you'll see GCL, you'll see GCC, the ganglion cell complex includes the ganglion cells as well as the IPL. Doesn't matter, you get a little bit better resolution with just the ganglion cell layer because that's what I'm more concerned about in glaucoma. And again, we go back to reference databases. Here is a classic ETDRS grid that most of our OCTs will superimpose on the macula with sectoral thickness. The average thickness in this particular sector is 295 microns. And these are again, statistically evaluated against reference databases. Hey, so Jim, here's a, Jim, can you go yeah. back? Can you go back one, actually two slides now? Two slides. Because when we okay. get the when we get these surveys, um, we always get the critique of using, you know, we always rattle off epiretinal membrane and vitreomacular traction. You mentioned VMA, that would be vitreomacular adhesion. And the difference between vitreomacular adhesion and vit vitreomacular traction is that there's no retinal distortion in a VMA versus a vitreomacular traction where there's traction. So we just get the surveys that say that. The speakers always rattle off all these initials. So you said VMA. I just wanted to My let bad. everyone know that it's vitreomacular adhesion uh, that was out there. So, yep. yep. And and you know optometry is is full of uh, the alphabet soup of right. of whatever. Somebody else reading our records. We're like, what in the world are they talking about? Good point, Greg. So, no, they're just just going what our survey say. Thank you. All right, so our ETDRS, here's another alphabet soup, early treatment diabetic retinopathy study uh, grid. Um, when we're talking about glaucoma, we need to be careful that we're not using total retinal thickness. So again, we can have an arcuate defect, for example, coming from this nerve heading here toward the fovea, and it could affect just a portion of this particular sector here, but if the majority of that sector is rather plush and unaffected, the overall thickness in that sector is going to be relatively robust. So the downside to using total retinal thickness, especially when we're looking at an ETDRS grid, is that we can get lulled into a false sense of security. If you're going to use an ETDRS grid, which I, I have my own cautions about that anyway, I would only use it in the context of retinal thickness when we're dissecting out either the ganglion cell layer 
or the ganglion cell complex, because this gives me a better picture of what I'm interested in insofar as glaucoma. This gives me a much better picture of what I'm looking at when I'm dealing with a patient who has macular disease. But when I want to look at glaucoma, I'm really more interested in just the ganglion cell layer or the ganglion cell complex. So again, here's a TopCon instrument, again, with macular reports. And all of our instruments will you know, print out whatever onto an eight and a half by 11 piece of paper. That eight and a half by 11 piece of paper is prime real estate. We've got a lot of information that needs to go onto that sheet. And you can set your OCT to print however you would like it to print and include whatever information. So here we can have a 3D macular report. Again, this is a very nice OCT. If we're looking at global macular disease, aside from glaucoma, we can have a wide uh, report that includes not just the central fovea and central macula, but also includes the optic nerve. So this kind of gives us a global impression of what is happening. We can have a macula OU report so we can compare right and left. My point being that each individual instrument has its own default printer settings, and you can select from a variety of different prints what you want to see. I personally don't have our techs print out a report because I want to be much more active and I want to bounce between macula, I want to bounce between neuroretinal rim, I want to bounce between RNFL, and I want to look at particular sectors. So I'm going to be having workstations uh, pull up each individual patient's scans and I'll go through the particular pieces of information that are important to me rather than just looking at a printout because a printout simply can't have all of the information for you. So again, OCT analysis in the macular region can evaluate the ganglion cell layer and the RNFL. The point here is that the ganglion cell layer are or it constitutes the cell bodies of the ganglion cells and those cell bodies give rise to axons. We're talking about ganglion cells, the cell bodies live in the macula, the RNFL and the neuroretinal rim has the axons of these ganglion cells. So when we're looking at glaucoma, we can see damage in the macula, in particular in the ganglion cell layer. We can see damage in the perioptic RNFL in the axons, and we can also see damage in Brooks membrane opening and the minimum rim neuroretinal rim, which we'll get to in a second. Okay, so again, the axons of the ganglion cells are visible around the optic nerve. That's what gives us these striations and we can see them here. And if we have, you know, an adequate, an adequately clear media and perhaps a good fundus photograph, we can see these without OCT technology. But what we can't see without OCT technology is what's happening to the ganglion cell bodies here in the macula. So OCT certainly makes this a whole lot easier, but there's no way we'd, we would be able to see cell body damage over here in the macula without OCT technology. So before I get into neuroretinal rim scanning, let's uh, take another polling question. Is a five micron change in decreased thickness clinically significant? And Jim, there have been no new uh, chat room questions for you. Okay. That means everybody's either fallen asleep or I've answered the questions preemptively. I did get one here, direct message to me. So it says, this question is a little off topic. You said the optic nerve head is approximately 100 microns thick. Is OCT macula approximately 250 microns and how much loss do you consider significant? If I, if, if I said the optic nerve is 100 microns thick, that, that's incorrect. I apologize for that. So uh, read, the, read the question again, Greg. I'm sorry. Yeah, it says the question is a little off topic. You said the optic nerve head is approximately 100 microns thick. That was that part. Is OCT MAC at approximately 250 microns? And how much loss do you consider significant? All right. The OCT total macular thickness in a healthy individual is going to be about 250 microns. In a healthy individual, the perioptic RNFL circle scan will be anywhere between 60 and 150 microns, depending upon 
what sector of the perioptic RNFL we're looking at, namely going to be thicker superior temporally and inferior temporally and thinnest in the papillomacular bundle. So what is significant? If we're looking at clinical significance in glaucoma, I would not look at total retinal thickness. I would look at ganglion cell layer thickness because ganglion cell layer thickness is only about 45 microns. So if your instrument has resolution of four or five microns, a six micron drop in ganglion cell is going to be statistically significant. Over in the perioptic RNFL, you're dealing with a thicker tissue. So again, it becomes a percentage of that what becomes statistically significant. But again, these are all pieces to the glaucoma puzzle. So we need to put that together with what else is happening in other areas. So there is no firm answer to that question that the magic number is eight microns or five microns. It depends on where we're looking and what we're looking at. And correct answer here is really all of the above. If, if the instrument resolution is not good, if we're looking at overall retinal thickness, which is kind of the question that was just asked, uh, Greg, um, this kind of, kind of covers that. Perfect. Yeah, Jim, while you're, I'll give you a little second to breathe there. The other thing that I think that you might bring it up eventually is that remember that, um, you know, the vitreous, and this is in older patients and the vitreous is kind of a living becoming active as we're getting older. And I've seen where, you know, there's been vitreomacular adhesions, tractions around the optic nerve and impending PVD, you know, and all of a sudden that nerve fiber layer around the optic nerve, or even in the macula become, yep. you know, they're thick. And then right. that PVD releases, right? And then that retina goes back, you know, changes 20 microns and they're all of a sudden there's a 20 micron change, right. but you see that that PVD is released. So, you know, the other thing is, is, you know, this, this, this eye is a living organism, the the vitreous is a living entity um, that can certainly influence it. So yeah, I, I'd be careful, just like you said there, be careful with certain amount of microns. What I like to go by is asymmetry. You know, if there's asymmetry between the eyes. So. That's a, that's a great point. There's, there, there's a lot of, of tractional issues that can make it worse, you know, look like an edematous optic nerve in the case of neuro op. Uh, when they release, it can look like a normal optic nerve or an optic nerve that's now has glaucoma simply because things got thinner. And Jim, go, just going back to your previous questions, I think I know what the, the, the author of the question you're looking for about nerve fiber layer defects being pathognomonic for glaucoma because they, they've seen them. They, they don't really assess them as having glaucoma. You mentioned pseudo defects. I mean, yeah, that, that is... I think a common cause or, or mistake, there, there are anatomic variants that look like it. And, and Greg, you share in here too. My experience is the other, the other thing that I've come across that, give, that has given wedge defects has been HIV infection. I'm not sure, Jim or Greg, if you ever, if you ever came across that. It's not a terribly well-known phenomenon, but I've seen it and it has been important. You said HIV? Yeah, HIV infections. Not AIDS or, or CMV retinopathy, but the, the, the infection. Sure. And, and the question is, you know, you have ganglion cells that are no longer there. Question number one was, were they there to begin with? Is, just this, is this just a normal anatomic variation for the individual? And those ganglion cells were never there to begin with. Or if they were there, and you might not have the scan because this is a new patient sitting in front of you for the first time it's raising a flag. Does this patient have glaucoma? Is this early glaucoma that I'm looking at? Well, glaucoma, the advantage that we have is it takes a while, but things change. So we take a scan on day one, we bring the patient back month three, month six, whatever. Uh, if that patient is not budging at all, that indicates that they're, they're, they don't have glaucoma because something would be changing. And I'll get to a case of just that uh, in, in a bit. Okay. Thanks, now, Jim. Yeah, thank you. Um, deviation maps. Let's talk about this. Deviation maps kind of help us to put, again, some of the pieces of the puzzle together. Now, again, each instrument does, does deviation maps uh, differently. What we're looking at here, this is total retinal thickness. This is a thickness map. So this is not statistics here. This is a what appears to be a relatively healthy uh, perifoveal 
macula. We maybe have some thinning here, kind of hard to, hard to say, but when this patient is statistically analyzed, just looking at total retinal thickness, this particular deviation map is saying, hey, you know, this inferior temporal area of the retina is statistically thinner. And this patient, you know, is, is bringing with them an optic nerve that looks somewhat suspect. Perhaps there's some thinning inferior temporally. This is a, a good example of where two plus two should equal four. So here we have total retinal thickness. Here we have our deviation map from a statistical perspective, but we have to ask ourselves, what are we looking at here? This area, if this is in fact glaucoma, would be axons. Those axons have cell bodies somewhere. Where do those cell bodies live? Those cell bodies live over here, but this is total retinal thickness. We can now dissect out just RNFL, the retinal nerve fiber layer. So here's our axons that are statistically thinner. We also have perhaps some thinning of axons superior temporally, but these axons have their cell bodies where? Those cell bodies live here. And when we go to our next deviation map, which is ganglion cells, sure enough, we have ganglion cell loss here. So going back, we see axonal loss here that is connected to cell body loss here. That plus this, plus what we're looking at at the optic nerve kind of makes it easy to say that this patient clearly has glaucoma. So here's a 66-year-old Caucasian female who's referred in by her primary care doc because he saw some cataracts. IOPs in the low 20s, six by six, five in the right, six, five by eight, a little suspect certainly in the left and thin packs. <clears throat> so here we're looking at ganglion cell. Again, we got to look at this tab. So we're looking at ganglion cell thickness. We have ganglion cell body loss here in the left eye. These ganglion cell bodies are connected to axons that would show up here. So when we go to the RNFL, or when we go to the RNFL deviation map, we see the axons here. So again, we've got this wedge defect. We have loss of axons here. We have loss of ganglion cell bodies here. This patient clearly has glaucoma. Again, more pieces to the puzzle. The more pieces that we have that all add up to the same thing, then we have a higher likelihood of having glaucoma as opposed to a red herring. So another poll question at this point. The best tool in your glaucoma toolbox is your what? <laughs> Hopefully. You had, someone, you had someone like that one. So I did. Say. I did. Uh, so Dr. Jim, Google. Uh, Jim, do you, uh, do you not subscribe to the Facebook School of Medicine as well? <laughs> um, no, uh, you can get your degree in medicine on Facebook uh, by filling out your name and your email address, I think, correctly. Other than that, you might need your birth date in there, but um, no. I mean, Dr. Google is a very good local practitioner, but if you want to be on a university scale level, it's Facebook School of Medicine. Yeah, Dr. Google practices in my area, too. He's, he did the best cataract surgery. He's the world's best cataract surgeon. He lives in my area. We all have that same world's best cataract surgeon. All right, hopefully the best brain, I'm sorry, the best toolbox that we have is our brain because there's going to be confounding factors. There's gonna be a variety of other pieces of this puzzle. Glaucoma has many, many different pieces. And the more pieces that we can get together from our OCT that points us in the right direction, that ultimately gives us the tools to make the clinical decision, which is done here. Okay, let's get to, this is something that's that's important. The neuroretinal rim, you know, we, we've talked about looking at glaucoma over here. We've talked about looking at glaucoma in the macula, but OCTs for the longest time, really, it kind of ignored the optic nerve itself, which is a bit counterintuitive. So let's take, instead of a circle scan around the optic nerve, let's take a series of radial scans through the optic nerve. And what does that do for us? Well, one thing that it does right off the bat is shows us 
geographically, how big of an optic nerve canal we have. We can see the neuroretinal rim. And again, this is just one scan, a horizontal scan, but we can take as many scans as we want. Typically, the spectralis defaults to 64 radial scans here, but by looking at different radial scans, we can get a very clear picture of exactly what's happening at the optic nerve, which is what we haven't been looked at looking at for a long time. This goes back to an old histology textbook, and, and you know, this still pertains. Every one of those axons that make up the optic nerve end up making a right turn and exiting the eye at the optic nerve medial to the RPE and Brooks membrane. Not one of those million axons. Take a shortcut and dip down through here and underneath the choroid and out here and take a shortcut to get into the optic nerve. Every one of these axons passes medial to Brooks membrane opening, and you're going to see BMO quite regularly. BMO is basically a marker of the optic canal. Now, in days before we had OCT technologies, I would make drawings exactly like this in my paper charts. This is the scleral canal. Okay, this is the optic nerve. This is the hole where the, all of these axons can exit the eye. Some of them are going to be relatively thick as we get close to the optic nerve. Other individuals, if they have a, you know, a large disc or have glaucoma or they're very myopic, this RNFL surface is going to kind of gradually dip down. But this is the neuroretinal rim, and this is where all of those axons are. There are no rods. There's no cones. There's no other cells in here other than structural cells and blood vessels, but this is all axons. And that's what we're looking at here. So most of our OCTs have the resolution to be able to clearly identify Brooks membrane opening. Anteriorly, the most anterior part uh, is the internal limiting membrane. So it, the internal limiting membrane is very readily identified on OCTs. Brooks membrane opening is readily identified on OCT, the only thing between Brooks membrane opening and the internal limiting membrane are axons. Now there are gonna be some blood vessels in here too, but these are axons. So this gives us the ability to look at the neuroretinal rim. There's a variety of configurations that this uh, Brooks membrane opening can, um, can take. But the point is that I think from a, clinically validated perspective, you're going to see something called the minimum rim width, which is basically a measure from Brooks membrane opening to the closest point of that internal limiting membrane, whether it's straight horizontal, straight vertical, or diagonal. This minimum rim width tells us, as the name implies, what is the minimum thickness of these axons in this particular sector that we have taken. So again, we can see here Brooks membrane opening. We can see here relatively thin neuroretinal rim and a relatively thin neuroretinal rim here. But keep in mind that Brooks membrane opening and the optic canal are things that we can not really see when we're fundoscopically looking at the patient. Okay, and, and that also plays a role in why I can look at an optic nerve and call it a five by six, and someone else could look at it and call it a, a seven by seven five. Um, by using OCT technology, we've completely objectified the cup to disc ratio, we've completely objectified this neuroretinal rim. And we're going to see many cases where the clinical disc margin that we see 
outlined, for example, by these green dots is going to be different than where Brooks membrane opening is. We can generally see the red, I'm sorry, the green, the clinical disc margin when we're looking fundoscopically at the eye, but it becomes impossible just fundoscopically to see Brooks membrane opening. And that plays a role in what the OCT printouts look like in a, in a second. So a typical Brooks membrane opening minimum rim width printout is going to have a couple of valuable pieces of information. Number one, it's gonna give us the area of Brooks membrane opening. So we have an idea as to the exact size of that hole in the back of the eye where these axons can exit. Whether that hole is big, whether that hole is small, that of course plays a role in how big or how small the optic cup is and how thick or how thin the neuroretinal rim is. This is a, a BMO printout. These are just the, the 12 clock positions and these two are also plotted against a reference database. This is a healthy, normal eye. Each sector has a green arrow showing the minimum rim width. All of these are entirely normal. 360 degrees around the optic nerve, this is an entirely normal uh, BMO printout. Now, this is a um, Topcon Maestro, and it kind of does the same, same thing. It gives you the optic canal and it gives you the uh, the cup margin, but they use uh, they do it somewhat differently. They identify Brooks membrane opening. And again, this is why we need to know what our technology does. It identifies Brooks membrane opening and it picks an arbitrary point, 120 microns anterior to that. And at that 120 micron point, that is where the cup is. So the disc is from here to here as evidenced by Brooks membrane opening, but the cup is 120 microns north or anterior to that. And this cup margin is identified here. That's why I see a lot of times on uh, in a variety of, of different posts, hey, I'm looking at this OCT and the cup to disc ratio just looks different from what I am seeing clinically. Again, this is where the devil is in the details. This cup is identified by a, a, a line 120 microns north. And again, this is with the Topcon Maestro. Every instrument is different. So we can look at the eye. We can imagine where we would see the optic canal. We can't see Brooks membrane opening. We can see where this OCT measures or identifies the cup margin. And again, this helps us to get a feel for quantitatively what's happening at the optic nerve. Now, here's a patient with advanced glaucoma, again, with our, our, our printout. And notice every one of these uh, minimum rim widths is red, meaning it's statistically aberrant. And we have very, very, very little neuroretinal rim here in this inferior temporal scan. Again, that's not surprising. We have a little bit more robust remaining neuroretinal rim nasally, but our temporal rim is relatively thin. So here's an individual with, an, with advanced glaucoma. These are the 64 radial scans. I'm just taking this one scan uh, that runs from superior nasal to inferior temporal. And notice this inferior temporal rim margin, we are down to six microns. There's not a lot of tissue left there. So if there's a notch, this is what a notch looks like. Although there's a couple of microns, there may be only a handful, a dozen or so uh, individual axons here. So this is an individual clearly with advanced glaucoma, but we can now quantify this neuroretinal rim. And of course, the name of the game in glaucoma management is to make sure that this is not progressing over time. So each time they are scanned, I want to see this Brooks membrane opening plot unchanged. And again, we can have our subsequent scans superimposed on top of it. I can scroll through here and get individual micron measurements. And again, this goes back to what I said earlier about image registration. When I come back and image this patient six months from now or two years from now, this radial scan is going to be in exactly the same place. It's not going to be straddling. It's not going to be, well, not right here and not right here. It's going to be exactly in that same place so that I can compare apples to apples. Here's a Topcon 
Maestro again showing us uh, disc topography. The disc topography scan is basically Brooks membrane opening and the neuroretinal rim. Again, this is plotted against a reference uh, database as well. And in this particular printout, you can have the retinal analysis, you can have the ganglion cell complex uh, analysis, you can have the RNFL analysis, and you can also have the disc analysis. Again, more information. There's a lot of information on this eight and a half by 11 piece of paper. And sometimes it behooves us just to go to the instrument and look exactly at what we are, um, you know, what, what particular area we're looking for. So let's have another polling question here. Where does structural changes appear in OCT imaging? Of course, this is in the context of glaucoma. So where does glaucoma to structural change appear in OCT imaging? Hopefully, if I've done my job, you should know the answer to this. And we've got and the answer is <clears throat> survey says perfect it could be at the circumpapillary rnfl it could be at the neuroretinal rim but it can also be at the macula so truth be told if we're going to obtain baseline scans for our glaucoma patients we need to look at the macula we need to scan the macula, we need to look at the RNFL, we need to scan that, and we also need to scan the neuroretinal rim. And there, there's a question that came in. Is it always the case to have abnormal ganglion cell layer and normal RNFL and BMO in early glaucoma since it's a ganglion loss disease? Joe, can you say the question again? Is it normal to yeah. have is, ganglion? Is it always the case to have abnormal ganglion cell layer loss and normal RNFL and BMO in early glaucoma, since it's a ganglion loss disease. It could be, but other individuals in early disease will show manifest changes at the neuroretinal rim first before the ganglion cells die. Keep in mind that the, that the axons in the, neuro, in the neuroretinal rim, especially in the deep neuroretinal rim, get their blood supply from the choroid. Uh, whereas the uh, cell bodies in the macula get their blood supply from the anterior retinas. So I would venture a guess that diseases such as uh, any vasculopathic disease, for example, such as diabetes, may have a predilection for damaging the ganglion cell bodies in the macula before the axons in the optic nerve are damaged and vice versa. Other diseases can affect or glaucoma can be manifest first in the optic nerve in the Brooks membrane opening, minimum rim width RNFL, and then ultimately eventually show damage in the macula. So it can happen both ways, I think. And, and the key is it's gonna change over time. And I think the key is also, and I can't back this up with statistics, but I think that a lot of vasculopathic diseases are gonna play a role in how or why some patients manifest early glaucoma this way versus other patients manifest early glaucoma in a different fashion. And, and, and Jim, I, I think that question, which is a very good question, is kind of analogous to an earlier, very simplified question that we all used to ask and, 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 question, and wonder about. And that was, do you have a change in the, in the nerve, nerve fiber layer first or the visual field first? I think it is very much the same answer you just, you just gave. It's, it depends. It depends. And in that particular situation, it also depends on what type of visual field we're using, which I'll get to in a second. Hopefully we'll have time to discuss that, but that's also a, a very significant issue. And boom, here we go. Macular hey, relationship. Hey, Jim, field. just be before you move on, yeah. let's just <clears throat> clarify the Brooks membrane opening. Mm -hmm. the, it, it does not change in a glaucoma situation, it remains stable. It's the neuroretinal rim, it's the nerve fiber layer axons, it's the ganglion cells. Is that correct? That is correct. Brooks membrane opening stays fixed. Brooks membrane is where it is. The number of axons that are traveling over top of it is what's going to change, correct? Yeah, I just want to make sure, because it was in that question, it looks like there might've been a little bit asking about if that BMO is changing, that's going to remain the constant. So my, my bad is yes. BMO okay. will change the saying it's, it's the 
overlying minimum rim width that will change. Nope, I don't think it's a bad. It's what we're here to educate on. So thank you. All right. And going to Joe's point, you know, we talked about the, the density of ganglion cells in the macula. Uh, that's why there's been a move toward 10-2 perimetry or selective perimetry. Now, selective perimetry is not used that often. That is the um, frequency doubling technology some folks have. Uh, there's also something that tickles the uh, uh, M cells, the ganglion cells, uh, that is called the flicker defined form. This is a Heidelberg uh, product. They don't market it anymore, but I have a Heidelberg edge perimeter. And what the purpose of selective perimetry is, whether it's FDF or FDT, is that it stimulates the M-type ganglion cells. Now, the M-type ganglion cells have been shown to be the preferentially damaged ganglion cells in early glaucoma. When we throw a white test point on a patient's fundus. We're tickling all of their ganglion cells. When you use flicker-defined form or frequency doubling technology, you're primarily just stimulating the M ganglion cells. So when we go to 24-2 standard white-on-white -white perimetry, and Joe, this goes to the question that you just asked, when we're looking at a 24-2 white-on-white in early glaucoma, more often than not, we're not going to see a visual field defect because we're using, I think, the wrong test. We either need to be using a 10-2 visual field test or selective perimetry. Since most of us don't have selective perimeters, the really the, the focus should be on 10-2 visual field testing, which is ultimately the goal of, of, of parametric testing in glaucoma is to see progression, but in the early cases to identify early disease. And that brings us perfect segue to the glaucoma uh, report from, from Don Hood, the Hood, Hood report. Um, the Hood report is very interesting. Number one, a couple of things that you'll see uh, differently. Don finally convinced several companies to, instead of beginning our scan temporally and ending temporally. He said, start your scan nasally, and that gives us a clean sweep through the temporal fibers. And what that does for us, instead of having a T-SNIT graph, we now have an N-STIN graph. But all of our temporal fibers are roughly from here to here. So the important meat of the potato, if you will, in glaucoma is in the center of this graph. Whereas a T-SNIT T SNIT graph. We have temporal on this side. We have temporal on this side. I want to see what's happening in the temporal aspect. So this kind of gives me all the areas that are affected by glaucoma in the center of this graph. Now, with the Hood report, we can still have our RNFL circle scan in the form of an n -stin. We can have our Garway Heath sectors. We still have our minimum rim with, again, those are the radial scans through the optic nerve. We have our Garway Heath sectors there. Forget the right side of this uh, printout for a second. Let's just look here. Uh, what we're looking at here is what we would see when we are looking in the eye. So here is an example of the retina view. In other words, the fundoscopic view, looking at the RNFL thickness. And we can see in this patient that there is a wedge defect here. And if we look at the ganglion cell layer thickness, because we have a wedge defect here in axons, we're probably going to have ganglion cell loss here. And we can infer that there's ganglion cell loss here. So this is structurally an inferior defect. And of course, if we run a, a visual field on this, we're going to end up with a visual field defect above. So instead of flipping our visual field around, here are our 24-2 visual field plots, but notice the retina has now been flipped north and south. 
Okay. Somebody's writing on this and that's not me, but that's okay. I got, um, I got it. I got it, Jim. There you go. Um, so here, are the, these dots represent the 24-2 test points, but notice our scan here has now been inverted to match up with where we would see visual field defects. So this is called the field view as opposed to the retina view. And we do the same thing with a 10-2 visual field. If we were running a 24-2 visual field on this individual, we would probably pick up a point here. That's point certainly going to be normal. That's going to be normal. That's going to be normal. We might pick up a couple of points that are abnormal. And maybe, just maybe, in this particular individual, we would be better served with running a 10-2 visual field because we're going to be testing more points in that area that seems to be defective, which is basically right here. And that's where the hood report really comes in handy. So these images in the field view are the fundoscopic views that are inverted top to bottom, not left to right, but top to bottom. So in this particular individual, if we run a 24-2 visual field, we're going to pick up a couple of points, which makes sense because they're going to be, there's going to be some damage here. Okay, that fits. Again, 2 plus 2 equals 4. When we run a 10-2 visual field, notice these visual field uh, defect points are much closer to fixation, and they correspond to those few points right there. So again, the hood report kind of gives us an idea grossly anatomically what's happening, but it also gives us a pretty good idea of perhaps which would be our best or preferred visual field strategy at 24-2 versus a 10-2. Here's a 47-year-old African-American female, moderate, myop, maternal uh, grandmother with uh, glaucoma, IOPs in the 20s, suspect discs. Uh, there's inferior temporal thinning we can see. We can see an inferior temporal RNFL defect, plain as day. But do we also have a superior defect? So here's a TopCon instrument, again, using a hood report. So again, we have an N-STIN graph. All of our pertinent Glaucomatous information is in the middle. We have a retina view. And I think with our retina view of the RNFL, we can see a little bit of thinning. If we're looking at an on FOS view, we can see a little bit of thinning. When we look over at the ganglion cell thickness in the uh, retina view, in other words, anatomic view, there may be a little bit of thinning here, but the retinal ganglion cell layer, that looks pretty good. When we flip these around and use the field view, again, this is what this is, but inverted, okay? And in the TopCon instrument, they have both at 24-2 test points and the 10-2 test points together. The 10-2 are the smaller uh, spots, the 24-2 are the larger spots. Uh, if we And we see here when we run a 24-2, we're going to pick up a few points, but maybe we're better off served by using a 10-2. Uh, and again, when we're looking at central macula, this is the ganglion cell layer inverted in a field view with the superimposed 24-2 test points. We're going to pick up a few test points here, but we're going to hit a lot more test points with our 10-2. So here's our 24-2. You know, on our pattern deviation, classic. We got three non-contiguous points in our total deviation. Yeah, we've got a few points that are somewhat contiguous. Uh, in our 10-2, we're getting a little bit more uh, meat here, if you will. Uh, and when we superimpose, this is not how the hood report is. This is this was something that Don Hood uh, did for us that um, basically imposed the visual field, superimposed the visual, the actual visual field on top of, of anatomically what is happening. And we can see these visual field defect plots matching up, but we're also picking up a visual field defect superiorly that we weren't really expecting to see when we were looking at this patient clinically. And that clearly is uh, defined a bit better on the 10-2 visual field. Here's a 66-year-old 
Uh, male IOPs of 21 and 17 with chronic angle closure glaucoma. So you know that there's going to be some structural defects here. We can certainly see those diffuse uh, defects when we're looking at the fundus. Again, we have our N-STIN. We have our RNFL thickness, our anatomic retinal view. We have our ganglion cell layer, anatomic retina view. We can see a wedge defect here. We can see some diffuse thinning here. Notice on the ganglion cell layer, uh, we see some diffuse thinning here. When we flip both of these over to look at our field view, uh, our 24-2 and 10-2 points superimposed on both the global RNFL thickness and on top of just the ganglion cell layers. Again, these are inverted views when we run visual fields. Of course, this patient has chronic angle closures. There's going to be a, a bit more of a visual field noticeable on a 24-2. Our visual field defects gets close to fixation on the 10-2. And when we um, kind of artificially superimpose these on the uh, printout, we can see very clearly the 24-2 visual field test points being picked up by some of our OCT scan, whereas our 10-2 visual field is going to be picking up a lot of points in our uh, ganglion cell macular scan. Point being is that in early glaucoma, uh, the Hood Report really plays a good role in helping us to determine whether we should use a 24-2 or a 10-2. In individuals who have uh, more advanced glaucoma, we can see how the structure and the function match up very, very nicely. Again, the Hood Report doesn't show us what the visual field test result is, but it does show us where the visual field testing points would be superimposed on the anatomic defect, if there is the defect. Uh, just in the interest of time, I wanna skip through this particular case and I wanna talk about progression. And progression is, is the name of the game. Our, our goal as clinicians is to stop the progression of glaucoma. And that progression is gonna be manifest as deterioration of the optic nerve and the ganglion cells, as well as deterioration of the visual field. But this is going to occur over time. And the only way we can tell, at least from an OCT perspective, if we have progression, is that we need to obtain adequate baseline scans. If we don't have, if we don't have good baseline scans, there's no way in the world we're gonna be able to determine progression. So progression is really predicated upon obtaining accurate baseline scans and obtaining accurate baseline scans is predicated upon knowing to where to look for damage. And that damage is going to be at the macula and the ganglion cells, at the perioptic RNFL, or at the neuroretinal rim. The only thing that we can do really is control IOP, whether we use medications or surgery or lasers, whatever. But here's where Oates, the original Oates study comes in and helps us. In our early glaucoma patients, the patients who have ocular hypertension, who have relatively healthy looking optic nerves, when we run those scans, especially if they don't have glaucoma and they're just at risk, the OCT scans are going to come back pretty much normal. But for those individuals who were in the OAT study who did in fact convert, they converted mostly due to structural change. Some of them had visual field changes, but the majority of them converted from being a suspect to an actual glaucoma patient due to structural changes at the optic nerve, in particular, the inferior temporal and the superior temporal neuroretinal rim. So that means for us clinically, when we see this ocular hypertensive patient who's a glaucoma suspect, who does not have a visual field defect, who does not have anything abnormal for an OCT finding, if they're going to convert, typically chances are it's going to be inferior temporally or superior temporally. So when we run our OCTs, we need to look at the inferior temporal and superior temporal neuroretinal rim. We need to look at the inferior temporal and superior temporal RNFL, and we also need to look at the ganglion cells above and below that horizontal raphe.
Uh, we know that in advanced glaucoma, um, in order to stave off further progression, we need to drive IOP down. But the bottom line is that wherever the patient has lost structural tissue, whether that's in the macula, the perioptic RNFL, or the neuroretinal rim, if we can drive IOP down, we should hopefully not get any further progression. Of course, there are going to be some folks that will progress in spite of what we do, but again, we have to have baselines in all three areas. So here's a, one of our final polling questions. I'm sorry. One of the advantages of the Hood Report, there are many, but one of the advantages is that it <clears throat> Jim, there, there are a few questions that have, that have come in. Sure. One is, any thoughts on the 24-2C program on the Humphrey Visual Field of it, it, it's It saves a, a little bit of time, but, you know, at, at the end of the day, it, pick a visual field. Patients hate it. Patients don't do well with it. There are some that are good visual field test takers. Of course, the longer we take, to do a visual field, the less reliable the results become. But of all of the things that we do, visual fields still remain a subjective test, whereas OCT is more objective. So yeah, there are instances when I'm certainly concerned about visual field progression, um, but I'm really concerned about OCT progression because if our visual field was that precise, it would go hand in hand and tandem with OCT progression. So I tend to lean more on OCTs rather than visual fields. Do I think it makes a big difference as to what type of visual field uh, test, whether we're doing uh, fast or even faster or whatever you want to call it? No, a white on white visual field is going to give us some information, whereas um, selective perimetry or 10-2 might be important for those early glaucoma patients. And I'll take a stab at that 24-2C, just so the audience knows what Zeiss did. And that's what it says here from Zeiss. What they did is they took a, the 24-2 and they took 10 points off the 10-2 and merged them together. And those are your people that are out there. And I present this in the visual field and I'll try and rattle off some of the names. One is you kept saying all night long, Jim, is, is Don Hood. The other one, I believe, is Gardner. Another one in there, I believe, was Schwartz. And uh, they were the expert panel that looked at the 10-2 and picked those 10 spots. I thought the surprise was going to be that it would be kind of jaded. Those 10 spots would be jaded towards the nasal side. But there's actually five like on the nasal side and five on the temporal side. So I do like the 10-2 report if I'm going to get away from a 10-2 and doing it all together. So that would be my comments on the 24-2C by Zeiss. There's another one in, yeah. go, go ahead, Joe. Should, should, we do it, should we be doing the 10-2 visual field as our primary visual field for glaucoma suspects? That's one of our questions. Well, and that's a good question. And the way that was worded for our glaucoma suspects, which implies a relatively healthy looking optic nerve and a relatively clean looking OCT, then I think the answer is yes, we should be doing a 10-2 because we're, there's more likelihood of picking up a defect there than with a 24-2. Once that patient has advanced disease or has a visual field defect, I'll move over to a 24-2 because I want to see if that visual field defect, however big or however small it is, I want to see if that defect over time changes. And you can, you can get yourself lost with a 10-2 when there's a lot of visual field loss in a 10-2. Sue made a comment here about, um, you know, thanks for superimposing those OCTs for educational purposes, you know, that's been great illustration. Thanks for, you know, that will help with the guide, so on and so forth. The only caution I'll point out is that sometimes that, that defect that way Jim was pointing it out and there's going to be targeted perimetry and that's some of the new stuff that's coming out. Great for educational, but sometimes that defect is not where the dropout is. The visual field is maybe a little bit different uh, where that defect is, but I agree, Jim. Thanks for doing that. 
Yep. And, and, and again, there's, there's, there's shortcomings with all technologies, but um, with visual fields, you're also throwing in the subjectivity of the entire test. Whereas with OCT, it's pretty objective. You're going to get some media issues that can, can affect the OCT scan quality, but um, yeah, it's going to be pretty, pretty straightforward. <clears throat> Oops, I didn't stop sharing. Let me get that off your screen for you. All there right. You go. Yep. So a quick approach to the new patient. There's really only two questions that need to be answered when we're dealing with glaucoma. Number one is, is there disease present? That's our first question, especially the first time we're seeing an individual. And we have a, the first couple, two, three visits to, to answer that question, is there disease present? But once we've made the determination, whether there is disease or even if there's not disease, every subsequent follow-up visit at that point becomes a question of, is this patient stable? So that initial visit is going to you know, include several tests, including OCT. It's going to include visual fields, pachymetry, gonioscopy, et cetera. And, and it might take us two or three visits to get that um, information. But if a patient's presenting to the office as a new patient with advanced disease, you don't need much technology to see the advanced disease. You need the technology to see the subtle disease early on, and you need the technology, in particular OCT, to see subtle change over time. So our OCTs uh, and, and our approach to the new patient, again, we're going to use our clinical education, but we're going to scan RNFL macula and BMO. Here's a 64 year old new patient. And I'll, I'll probably finish with this because we're running out of, out of time. Suspect nerves in the right and left IOPs 1918. Uh, CDs kind of uh, middle of the road, maybe a little bit suspect. Thin IT rims, uh, middle of the road uh, packs. Here is a standard single circle RNFL circle scan in the right. That RNFL circle scan uh, seems to be rather robust. It follows the, the normal double hump, whereas in the uh, left eye, there is a little bit of an inferior temporal uh, thinning in this area. Uh, if we look at the um, macula scan and the right total retinal thickness, uh, relatively normal. There's really not a lot of asymmetry between the superior and inferior aspect. The left eye, however, does show some asymmetry between the inferior portion of the total retina and versus the superior retina. This is the HEP visual field. Uh, I'm not going to get into that, but the, the HEP visual field in the right is entirely normal. HEP visual field in the left clearly shows an arcuate defect, and this is this is one of the advantages to selective perimetry. We can identify a rather significant visual field defect on a 24-2 that corresponds to that small wedge uh, defect that we're seeing in fairly. So pretty classic, straightforward. This is a glaucoma suspect in the right. They have glaucoma in the left eye. They need to be medicated or treated somehow. We're going to skip that polling question and move on to how we establish or how what is the approach to an established patient? Quite simply, is there change over time. And where is that change going to occur? It's going to occur in any or all of those three regions. So it's incumbent upon us to get good baselines of these three regions so that we can see if there is change over time. What does change uh, look like? Here's an individual with a wedge uh, defect. We can see this wedge defect on total retinal thickness. So the hemisphere analysis uh, it shows some asymmetry uh, inferiorly versus superiorly. Our ganglion cell layer, uh, this is just a different color map. It's a heat map, but we can see some uh, thinning of the ganglion cell layer here as compared to the comparable areas superiorly. Here's our Brooks membrane opening and minimum rim width. In the uh, left eye, that actually doesn't look too bad, falling well within normal limits. On the initial visit, here's our three and a half millimeter RNFL circle scan, a little bit of thinning uh, inferior temporally, but nothing uh, major. Here's our 4.1 scan a little bit further out, again, showing some inferior temporal thinning. Uh, here's an individual that was lost to follow-up. They had this wedge defect. And three years later, that wedge defect 
was still there, hadn't budged at all and change over time. Total retinal thickness, there was no change. BMO, no change. RNFL, no change. So here, Joe, was that wedge defect that we saw earlier that over a three-year period, this patient was lost to follow-up really didn't change, as opposed to this patient who was a non-compliant individual over roughly the same time frame, a different individual who lost 51 microns. Very easy to see here that this patient progressed. Okay, uh, and we'll scoot through that. Uh, progression analysis, most of the OCTs have some form of progression analysis. That gets into the details. Uh, there's normal decline of ganglion cells, there's a normal decline of Brooks membrane over time. What is the slope of this patient's decline? Is that statistically significant or not? Again, uh, that's kind of probably in the deeper recesses of your OCT technology. So I know I ran a couple minutes late. I wanted to say thanks uh, everybody for hanging in there. Hopefully it didn't uh, keep you too long and hope that you got one or two pieces of information to be able to take home to clinic tomorrow morning, Monday. Jim, thank you very much. I, uh, you didn't really run over. You, you know, we had some housekeeping. I think you, you nailed it time-wise. Uh, I thought it was really an outstanding, uh, outstanding talk. Uh, you, you bring a lot of insight and clinical experience. And one thing I do want to mention as, as a speaker as well, and, and Greg is a speaker as well, and you were very, very good and very clear about your disclosures. You had a, a, an array of technologies that you discussed, but I think it's important that the audience knows that when we as speakers are talking about technologies, we're talking about the ones that we're most familiar with. Exactly. And if we, if we admit, omit anything or include anything, we are not trying to imply any sort of inferiority or superiority of any technologies. It's exactly. just basically what our experiences are. Exactly. Hey, Joe, is my screen being shared? And Joe, thanks is, for that comment. It, it is not. It is. it is not? No, only, uh, Jim's is still up. Okay. Jim, uh, can you unshare there for a second? I can. Good. I'm going to share mine. I got, for Susan that made the comment, I dropped in two slides before we end this. So Susan, this was taught to me by Bill Swanson at the Optometric Glaucoma Society in Orlando in 2019 where you, know, you could have this defect right here and then the visual field would show you know, good in this defect, so on and so forth. And what they're learning is where the, where the receptors are in the sense they're gonna be start doing some targeted perimetry to really start highlighting how that, that defect goes. So you know, that was, yeah, it, this is great when people start, Jim was putting great information layering on top of it, showing how that all works. Um, but we're also finding out that that visual field receptors are a little bit different. So don't be surprised if you, you know, you start laying them on top of it and you're going, well, why is that, you know, clearly a defect and it's showing that the patient can see because they're really mapping out how that visual field process is. So stay tuned. That's all I'm saying. So, all right, Jim, thank you for doing that. That was maximizing OCT interpretation in glaucoma equals maximizing care. Um, I do a lot of speaking in the OCT and certainly I learned a lot tonight. So thank you for doing it. Thanks, um, Greg and Joe, for having me. I really appreciate it. Yeah, it oh, we awesome. appreciate you doing it during course. Thank you. So that will conclude the CE part of, the, uh, of this uh, of this presentation.